Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. If there's one thing that cultures from around the world from all time periods can agree on, it's that humans love monsters. Dragons, werewolves, vampires, manticores, harpies, Mark Zuckerberg. There is no shortage of monsters to choose from mythologies from all over the planet. Of course, D&D had to fill its monster manual with its own catalog of fearsome monsters for players to fight against. For example, here is what a dragon looks like in D&D. And here's a werewolf. Here's a troll. And a vampire. And a lich. Okay, it's pretty fucking lame, right? Knowing that all the monsters you fight against are just a collection of organized numbers to do math against is the ultimate boner killer. It takes special effort on the part of the DM and players to transform these lifeless math tables into an image of horrifying death. The stats are for the game part of the role-playing game. The role-playing part is up to you. However, there are some special individuals who prefer to skip that part and just waltz through the game interpreting every single encounter as if the world was populated by math squares with legs. Today's three-part story stars a player who just cannot stop metagaming for the life of him, and how his world falls apart because of it. Also, for some reason, OP thinks that they're Shakespeare and that this is their modern retelling of Othello. So... I'm going to have some fun by reading it in an equally pretentious way. Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes to us from user Mad Academic and is titled The Life and Times of Statblock Man. Part 1. The Rise of Statblock Man. Friends, gather round and I shall tell you the tale of Statblock Man. From whence he came, few now know. But legend has it that he has memorized every stat block in every monster manual ever created. His actions are relatively tame compared to the tales of woe found here. But even so, he finds himself in this den of horror and madness. But first, let us introduce those who stalwartly stood to witness these events. DM, me, myself, and I, your humble narrator. Fighter, a player who had more patience than they had right to, but was quite vocal of their dislike towards the subject of our story. Barbarian, a quiet fellow who suffered in silence. Artificer. A penchant for forgiveness and tolerance, though they did speak out against Statblock Man. Sorcerer, the friend of Fighter and someone who also actively disliked Statblock Man. And Statblock Man, the legend himself, a man of metagaming prowess few have seen and someone eager to bask in the spotlight for all to witness their greatness. He also played an ASMR warlock slash cleric. Humble Beginnings Many moons ago, I first met Statblock Man while looking for a game in which I could play. At first, all was well. He was a little over-eager, but his enthusiasm was infectious. The game that he ran is worthy of a tale in its own right. But after playing with him for a little while, a spot opened up in my game. I, bright-eyed and full of eagerness, invited Statblock Man to join my merry band of players. Splendid, thought I. Surely all will go well, and we will have a great tale for the ages. Alas, how right I was, but for all the wrong reasons. And so, with joy in my heart for not needing to plumb the depths of Reddit or Roll20 for a new player, Statblock Man joined our ranks. The first sliver of worry entered me when I read his backstory. 
It was adequate for my purposes, but full of a dark brooding cloud of edginess. It smacked of a tragic hero, but without the trappings of subtlety. In a word, it felt like anime. However, my optimism prevailed, for I had great confidence in Statblock Man at this point. Mm, a tad gauche, I murmured. But nothing that cannot be fixed or used for narrative drama. And so my fears were laid to rest for the time being. When the next session rolled around, the party was faced with a revenant, a foul creature having been created from the body of a former enemy. I was delighted with the party's reaction. They were surprised and genuinely did not know what the creature was capable of. Artificer, in particular, enjoyed the enemy, as it was he who had killed the revenant when it had been human. He expressed his excitement at the unknown challenge. Then Statblock Man spoke. Do I know what this is? I asked him to roll a religion check, and as fate had decreed my doom, he rolled a natural 20. I divulged that Statblock Man knew only whispers and rumors of a thing called a revenant, a creature of malice and revenge. However, having come from the humble origins of a farming town, he knew little else. What proceeded to tumble from his mouth was nothing short of quoting the stat block of the Revenant. He told the party of its regeneration, that fire would stop it, that they needed to kill it lest it paralyze them, and that it was rolling extra damage due to its ties to them. I paused, took a deep breath, and reminded the man of stats that a natural 20 does not give you perfect knowledge. Stat block man quieted down and the fight continued. The Revenant was slain and the party rejoiced, though began to worry what had brought such a foe upon them. Alas, this commotion happened in an inn, and the captain of the guard was informed. The captain took the party aside and questioned them. The fighter and the sorcerer explained the situation. The barbarian was about to speak when another voice rose above all else. Statblock Man spoke, again reiterating all the forbidden knowledge that his character should not have possessed. This time, the barbarian did speak up. The DM didn't tell you those things. Stop it! But he would not be stopped, no. For as he spoke over all others, including this humble narrator, he began to describe his entire backstory. His great tale of misery and woe. How he sought to do great things but could only fail. How he felt he was destined for more but could not find the path. How he knew only the deaths of those who walked in his wake and the suffering of his former allies. All this and more after having only known these people for a few days. He then, for reasons beyond the ken of mortal folk, revealed that he was an Asimar by spreading his radiant wings in the tavern. None spoke. What could have been said in the face of such flagrant anime syndrome? The session ended shortly after, and I vowed to speak with Statblock Man in private to correct what I viewed as over-eagerness. Alas, dear reader, I was not prepared for what awaited me. Ah yes, the old LOL, I rolled a nat 20, the world is mine conundrum. Whenever I explain the concept of natural 1s and natural 20s to new players, I like to phrase it like this. A natural 20 allows you to succeed in the best plausible way while a natural one causes you to fail in the worst plausible way. Of course, the crux of this explanation is that the result needs to be plausible, or you risk breaking immersion. If you were to walk into a king's court and say, Lamau, I'm the new king, give me your throne, and then you magically roll a natural 20, congratulations! The king finds you amusing and doesn't immediately throw you into a guillotine for an attempted insurrection. See how that works? The game doesn't just immediately break because your plastic dodecahedron happened to come up on the best possible number. Okay, okay, I'll tell you what. The king will give you his throne if the next time you roll a natural one, your character slips on a banana peel and breaks their neck. Huh. 
Now that I think about it, players always argue for the immersion-breaking natural 20s, but never the neck-breaking natural 1s. Weird. Maybe we'll get some insight onto why that is in part 2. Also, OP doubles down on the Shakespeare shit, so sorry not sorry I am too. Part 2 is titled, The Life and Times of Statblock Man, A DM's Folly. Welcome back, dear reader. Last we left this bard's tale, I told you of Statblock Man. A man who could recite entire stat blocks of any creature that crossed his path. His tale continues with how he combined his prowess for metagaming with a love of spotlight stealing. We also see how this wretched narrator failed to stop him. A self-declared hero. After the debacle with the Revenant and Statblock Man's inexplicable relaying of his tragic backstory, I took the man aside. My dear fellow, said I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but you need to consider others. Also, please keep in mind that you are not the DM. Statblock Man agreed. He profusely apologized to any and all who would listen, and I sighed in the greatest relief. Good. The problem is solved. Or such was my thought at the time. Oh, if only it were true. The next few sessions saw peace. Statblock Man reigned in his behavior, and the party continued merrily onward to whatever doom that I had prepared for them. There were flashes of his need for the spotlight. Glimmers, but nothing extravagant. However, one night, when an innkeeper asked for a story, Statblock Man could not resist. Out burst his tumultuous tale of terror and tragedy. How he had embraced to follow the god of death, if only to find true purpose. How he had lost companions in the past and feared that he was the sole cause of their death, and how he might lead his current newfound friends to similarly gruesome, untimely ends. The fighter audibly groaned and spoke out of character. We get it, mate. Can we move on? Statblock man sputtered. But I... Enough, I said, and moved the session forward. Soon enough, the party were heading onward yet again. However, they were beset by their old foe, the Revenant. Statblock Man began to declare that he did not know anything about the creature, and proceeded to act accordingly, but not after a luxurious description of opening his wings to fly out of its reach. During the fight, the players came into a disagreement over a rule. I mulled over the problem and was beginning to declare my judgment when Statblock Man spoke. Hmm. Well, I know what I would do, said he most smugly. The sorcerer and fighter cried out in a single voice. We know, but if only there was someone who made rulings when there was a disagreement, like the DM you just spoke over. He was caught off guard. I sighed, declared my ruling, and moved on. The fight continued, but the dice declared a dismaying defeat should luck not be found. However, a hero was found in Statblock Man. As he charged the foul revenant and used Inflict Wounds, a wonderfully powerful spell indeed, one he had been bragging about for weeks. One that he was most eager to try if merely given the chance. How it would be so powerful were he to roll a natural 20. And as fate declared my doom yet again, he rolled a 20 most natural. And thus the crowing began. A few sessions later, Statblock Man continued to declare how he had saved everyone from the Revenant with a natural 20, ignoring that his previous behavior had endangered some of the party, and that the fighter and the barbarian had done much to whittle away the Revenant. 
Yet, what was more egregious was that he would take up our time by declaring mundane aspects of his greatness. The number of cantrips he had, how much potential he had, his grand, mm -hmm, contributions to our noble cause. By this point, my companions voiced concerns in private. First, the artificer spoke up. That stat block man was beginning to grate him. The fighter and the sorcerer assented this, the fighter confiding that they were losing their enjoyment. The barbarian was more ambivalent, and here, dear reader, is where I faltered. I should have removed the man of stats then and there, but I was also a player in his game on another day. I should have simply saved myself the troubles to come, but I begged my friends for time. I thought, Surely if I talk to him again, all will be well. And indeed, all was well. For a session or two. Yet by now the party was in trouble with a deadly dame of great wealth and influence. Though in private, Statblock Man still declared that he was a great help to the party. How he never erred or did wrong. I was non-committal in my replies. Though I did mention that dice are fickle. And thus my folly was revealed yet again in the events proceeding. The party encountered a Dybbuk, a demon that uses corpses as puppets. The party had embroiled themselves in a fight with the creature, a creature I was certain that none had seen, for I had scoured the tomes looking to stump Statblock Man. However, he saw through my cleverness and once more declared the creature's stats for all to hear. Ah! We must kill this thing, for it will find a new host soon. It is a foul demon, he declared, asking for no knowledge check to my utter surprise. Cease, we all declared. Stop this maddening metagaming. He was silent. Afterward, the fighter unleashed their ire upon Statblock Man. The fighter nodded in agreement with the sorcerer. The barbarian even voiced his dissent, and I spoke yet again with my woeful man of stats. I expressed my extreme dislike for his recounting of stats. I decried his spotlight hogging and his perpetual penchant for purposeful self-preening. I was losing patience, I said. He begged and pleaded for one final chance. I wavered in my resolve to remove him then and there, to never see hide nor hair again. I thought my ire would contain him. So I concurred one final chance. Thus my folly was complete, for I once more allowed him to carry on. Fate would have me pay most dearly for my blatant idiocy. In part three, our tale of woe concludes with a series of events that still leave me at a loss for words. Okay, so up until this point, I actually think OP has done the right thing by trying to work things out with Statblock Man instead of outright kicking him from the table. To me, Statblock Man's that guy symptoms are more a product of being overly excited than coming from a place of true malice. However, his actions are beginning to sour the experience of the other players, which is a no-go from me, champ. Here's a DM tip on how to deal with metagaming players without kicking them from the table. Okay, so in D&D and most other RPGs, there is a hierarchy of control over the game. At the bottom you have the players, who mostly just interact the world but are powerless against it in the grand scheme of things. Next, you have the rules, which are what makes the role-playing game a game and not just an awkward RP in a Discord chat. And finally, at the very top, you have the DM. Notice how the DM is above the actual rule books in this diagram. A metagaming player relies on what's in the book in order to get their forbidden knowledge. But humor me here, what if a certain almighty godlike being changed what was written in the books. Okay, so here's an example. Everyone knows about trolls and how the only way to stop their regeneration is with fire or acid. 
Now let's say you have a party moving through an active volcano, and they see some weird looking trolls hanging around some of the caverns. The wizard, having read the troll entry in the monster manual, launches a fireball to clear out the pack. But what the wizard doesn't know is that these are specially evolved subspecies of troll that have adapted to life living inside the volcano, and fire damage actually heals them. And the only way to stop their regeneration is with frost damage. Roll for initiative, fuckers! Now your party is scrambling to react to this unforeseen development, while desperately trying to unlearn what they already knew about trolls, which leads to a tense fight fueled by fear of the unknown. This effect was created by simply erasing one word in the stat block and replacing it with another. Now imagine how creative you really could get if you really wanted to fuck with some metagamers. Also, full disclaimer before we move into part three, OP doubled down on the Shakespeare shit again, so you all know what I need to do. Part three is titled, The Life and Times of Stat Block Man, of Clerics and Conclusions. Welcome back, dearest reader. Last we left this bard's tale was when Statblock Man declared himself the greatest hero for all to see. At last we come to the conclusion of this sordid affair. Before you await more metagaming, more self-proclaimed heroics, and an event maddening enough that I can still hear its echoing laughter. We can't go back. I are still fresh, we began anew. Stat block man was humbled, so thought I. The party was in somber spirits. No doubt they thought this narrator, their trusted DM, a fool of the highest folly. By this point, a Tempest cleric had joined our ranks and was warming themselves to the party as a whole. A noble spirit that he was, and whilst quiet, he provided the party with a fresh face to engage in glorious role-playing with. Never to be outdone, Statblock Man once more regaled us with his troublesome, tragic telling of terribleness. What arose next are what some may call, hmm, shenanigans. While I have nothing against such endeavors, it was at a time most critical. For you see, the fighter had picked up a sword most foul, a cursed weapon that was draining away their very self. They had planned to leave the city via ship, but the ship's master was on a schedule, so they did what all fear most. They split the party. Statblock man, fighter, artificer, and cleric went to a restricted part of the city, while barbarian and sorcerer stayed with the ship, begging for time. As I mentioned last, the party had fallen ill of a notably nefarious noble. Yet for some reason unbeknownst to any to this day, to pass into the restricted area while knowing that many of the guards were corrupt and in the pay of said noble, Statblock Man puffed out his chest and said, Worry not, friends, for I know what to do. His solution was to impersonate the captain of the guard, belonging to that same nefarious noble. It seemed as if fate was turning, for the dice decreed a dismal failure for that wretched man of stats. His reaction was to flee the guard. Up he flew, but like Icarus, he flew too high. Thwack, thwack, sang the crossbows as they shot him from the sky. And so Statblock Man fled to the docks. The guard gave a merry chase and took the fighter, artificer, and cleric into custody. The artificer used their quick wits to talk their way through, despite all odds, and were instead escorted to the temple. As payment for releasing the dear fighter from their curse, the temple priest asked the party to cleanse a close-by island of foul undead. And so they did, but not without Statblock Man crowing how amazing his daring escape from the city guard was. By this point, naught could be said, for he would be ceaseless in discharging his words. 
Wrapped in falsehood and self-aggrandizement, he babbled, oblivious to all. The events on the island are of little relevance, except for Statblock Man's recurring metagaming and the ghost incident. You see, good reader, Statblock Man knew no caution. Dice, thought he, are mine to command. I shall be the savior the party needs, even if they do not want it. Our stalwart cleric ended up possessed by a ghost. To save him, the dreaded statistician spoke up, rising like an unforeseen storm. Inflict wounds, said he. Broken from my reverie, I queried. My good man of stats, are you sure? Yes, he said, grim of voice. There is no other way. The ghost must be expelled from our most virtuous cleric, since he did not turn these foul undead as he should. Pause here. A moment to dwell and consider what Statblock Man has said. To tell another what he should have done. And thus he rolled once more. Fate, it seems, as fickle as dice, and she laughed once more. Natural twenty, quoth the stat block man. Natural twenty and nothing more. I paused. All was silent. Here was true madness, I thought. Poor cleric. He did not die, but the table was inflamed, engulfed in their passions and rage against stat block man and I. For he crowed mightily at the damage he dealt to his own ally, and I had allowed this to continue. Not without effort to abate it, but hope was fading. By now the fighter by this point was drained of will to play, the sorcerer likewise. And were this where our tale concluded, I would have left knowing all my failures were mine to bear. But tis not. By gods, there's more. Recall, fair audience, that the party had fallen afoul of a deceitful dame. A lady most wicked and powerful invited them to dinner. After the events of the island, none assented, for they felt a snare encircling them. The lady's guard insisted, their captain most vehemently. But no steel was drawn, no weapons clashed, until Statblock Man, who believed himself above consequence, attacked, shedding blood. His hubris sent him down in the first round, for he could not metagame against the guard captain, for this foul fellow was of my own design. Still, Statblock Man considered himself justified in his actions, crowing that he would win, though, despite this setback. The party was forced to shed blood, and the city guard was cold. Statblock Man was shocked when they were arrested. He grew grim, his crowing subsiding. The rest of the members could only offer him resentment. The fighter spoke out. Look what you've wrought! You fucked us! Statblock Man, for once, had no defense for what he had done. But no apology passed his lips. No word of sorrow was uttered. He maintained that he was right, and that there was nothing else to be done. But he spoke those dreaded words. It's what more character would have done. The party was subsequently exiled from the city for many years. The barbarian and artificer speaking most eloquently in the party's defense. But the damage was done. Valuable time and effort lost due to Statblock Man's hubris in ignoring consequence. Out of game, my friends were enraged. Too much! Too long, they cried. This dreaded statistician must be exiled. And I concurred. I pronounced his doom to them all. One by one, most fittingly, to Statblock Man last. His desire for the forefront had cost him dearly. He offered no defense for all his verbosity. He offered no last effort, and he faded silently as a shade. Tis done, I thought. Farewell, Statman. Farewell, monstrous metagamer. You who'd quoth, tis CR4. Farewell, I say. May you darken my game nevermore.
Epilogue Resilient reader, thus concludes my tale. Here inscribed in digital ink are the life and times of Statblock Man. I know not what became of him. He is out there somewhere, they say, haunting the pages of the web. He waits, I fear, to burden some other soul with his eldritch truths. But he is gone. The party has moved on to many new adventures, but the game yet lives. We're better for it, and look back at this sordid tale with laughter and light in our eyes. Ah, so the tale is told, my work is done. Thankfully, this narrator has been spared the horrors most others have endured. I fear my prose has put off some. But to those of you who have endured, there is still the tale of Statblock Man's campaign in which I partook. There is also a retelling I could do, but, humble reader, I leave that to you. End of story. Well, that was fun. So, OP actually did get around to writing that spin-off story, but I don't want to read it. For three reasons, actually. The first is that Staplock Man isn't even that bad in the story. The second is that OP really starts huffing his own farts with the Shakespeare shit. I mean, it was charming at first, and it was good for a laugh, but oh my god, no more. No more, please. And three. The second the story ended, I took Shakespearean English Drake out back and gave him the old yeller treatment. I mean, tea and biscuits or whatever is fine, but I am a red-blooded American. I prefer to snort raw coffee grounds mixed with gunpowder, thank you. Now before we go, let's take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from viewer Taser Ponds, and... Uh, Drake Ken has cringe. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> what the f is that? Is, is that a cat? Ma, there, there's a weird looking cat outside trying to steal the cringe from the garbage. Hello, Bear Bard. I heard about the fan fictions you wrote in high school. Where might you be hiding them, Bear? Ma, get the gun. Thank you again, Taser Ponds, for submitting your art. If you want to see your artwork featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can create content that inspires artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Dream.